let's really understand the, the granular components of thermal comfort and the technical elements that influence this debate. All right. Let's start with a classical definition of what is thermal comfort. I'll just state it to, uh, to begin with and then we'll look at some interesting parts of it which um, need to be illuminated upon. Thermal comfort is that condition of mind which expresses satisfaction with a thermal environment and is assessed by subjective evaluation. Two words I think stand out, at least for me, for an engineering definition. Now this is a definition created by an engineering society. It's the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. Engineers usually deal with objectively verifiable truths and facts. However, even they have had to include two elements which clearly indicate that there cannot be a very redu reductive separation of the object and the subject in the sense that the mind of the perceiver is an important inalienable element of thermal comfort and the second thing is that it is necessarily subjective. What we mean by this is that if you have a room of say 10 people and we ask all of them you know, to rate their thermal comfort on a scale of 0 to 5, invariably you will have a, a spread of the reported thermal comfort. What this means is that instead of debating and arriving at a certain central value and convincing people that this is comfort, we must instead take the view that the reported thermal comfort is the truth for that specific individual and we have to recognize the plurality of expectations that exists amongst human beings and different communities and societies and ethnicities etc. Uh, so the ASHRAE definition is broad enough however this can be even broader and we can go uh, further into this in the subsequent parts of this training. Okay, One quick quiz you can do with your students right then and there uh, if you are teaching this class is are you thermally comfortable in this room? This immediately gets them to think of thermal comfort not again as an abstract entity that exists in just textbooks. Thermal comfort is part of their daily lives. They might just not be cognitively aware of it. Before we act upon thermal comfort and integrating it in our design, let's first understand what are the merits and benefits of understanding thermal comfort. So first is it focusing on thermal comfort immediately helps decouple this, the mind of the designer from cooling versus comfort, means versus ends. This is often very invisible in our discourse around thoughtful cooling. So I think uh, uh, teaching or learning about thermal comfort first helps you decouple the means and the ends. The second one, uh, second merit would be if we understand thermal comfort as the primary need of a building and not cooling, this helps us prevent this rampant phenomenon of over designing of buildings where you have vested interests trying to over design the air conditioning systems to brave the worst possible day which will perhaps never occur in the 30, 40 year lifespan of the building and for that one specific instance where you know, people might feel discomfort for one, hour, one or two hours over a few decades. Air conditioning systems are being designed, uh, over designed as a default, which is not a very wise strategy for a finite planet. So focusing on thermal comfort allows us to, to question this, this uh, rampant phenomenon of uh, over design of air conditioning. In addition to reducing the size, focusing on thermal comfort versus air conditioning also reduces the energy cost because a smaller system, a more thoughtfully designed, appropriately sized system will use lesser energy as well. So this becomes the first aid in the process of becoming a energy conserving architect or a energy conserving air conditioning designer or a practitioner. Also, just for the pure technical purpose of designing a cooling system, if one doesn't know what the end goal of this air conditioning experience is going to be, Right? If we haven't nailed down at least the range that we need to try and achieve, we, are, we haven't made any headway in terms of designing a, a useful system. So understanding these ranges, the variables that affect thermal comfort is imperative even for the pure technical task of designing. Uh, 
A thermally comfortable environment constitutes a healthy indoor environment. So one common uh, pattern which would become visible in the storytelling that we discussed earlier uh, when you engage with people who've, who've experienced thermal uh, discomfort will invariably also report poor health uh, or, or poor building health and poor experience of their health when they are in these buildings uh, thereby indicating that these two things are enmeshed thermal comfort and health of the occupants are deeply uh, intertwined also a thermally comfort environment again could be verified through these interviews and storytelling with people is that they feel more productive when the environment is more thermally comfortable and the students themselves can verify this uh, and by the way again we mean not air conditioning increasing productivity thermal comfort increasing productivity right the conventional notion is that by uh, just air conditioning a space you can be more productive and be more charged up about whatever you're doing all right Understanding thermal comfort a little bit uh, deeper, the first two elements that are uh, commonly considered in, uh, in thermal comfort design are temperature and humidity. We will expand this definition more, but let's start with the two you know, usual suspects that people uh, consider when designing a thermally comfortable um, space. Here on the x-axis is temperature increasing to the right, on the y-axis is humidity increasing to the right. Very intuitively, one can say that either extreme temperature or extreme humidity, which is towards the top right corner, is not where most people like to be. Similarly, people would not like to be in extreme cold and extreme dry conditions. Thereby alluding to the idea that thermal comfort is a confluence or a blend of both these attributes and one needs to try and balance both of them to achieve thermal comfort. This here in general provides uh, a range that is acceptable to most people for humidity. At the center is a, <laughs> is a very interesting space or, or, a, or a condition that can be created through thoughtful design. This is, a, is a, not a very conventional term. Uh, it has been coined by some of the innovators in thermal comfort in India. It's the idea of what's called thermal delight. Thermal delight could be the highest standard one could uh, aspire to as a thoughtful designer, which means not only just acceptable or tolerable conditions, right? But conditions that you really, really uh, gravitate towards very naturally, which means you would want to occupy these spaces willingly, voluntarily, without being forced to. Uh, anecdotally, one can look back at your own life experience and try to think of moments where your entire being felt a certain upliftment when you entered a space and your body just went <sighs> because of the delight that you felt at a very core elemental level. Uh, one of the innovators in this, this field says that it's almost like your DNA is experiencing satisfaction. That is thermal delight. It can actually be achieved and a lot of historical buildings were very successful in achieving thermal delight and maybe this can be the standard uh, or the, the thing that we aspire to as as building designers. We have addressed this uh, subject uh, or this idea that the human body can be a great uh, representation or a good abstraction for what a building also must try and achieve with respect to thermal comfort. The body, human body pivots around this temperature of 37. We try to do things involuntarily. It's in our genetic code to be able to keep our body at 37 degrees. Building designers can look at this as an example of a very optimized, smart, environmentally sustainable way of uh, achieving thermal comfort without use of too much energy. Which means if we can get our buildings to do things when it's very hot to spontaneously lose the heat or do things spontaneously to gain heat when we are feeling too cold, that would enable us to mimic something that nature has so um, craftily evolved over time to create a system of thermal comfort. Yes, this just reiterates the points uh, that we made earlier, which uh, essentially equates thermal comfort mechanisms employed by the human body with things that could translate into better building design uh, by architects, engineers, so on and so forth.
Uh, one uh, point that I would like to emphasize before we move on is that most people think of heat as an inevitable thing that is coming from the outside and it is that heat that we are trying to battle you know, with an air conditioner. There's almost a sense of inevitability that we have no role to play in it. One of the cooling systems that we will address in subsequent sections is a system that does not see us as being or human beings as being needy of cooling rather it inverts the whole whole discourse and uh, works with the idea that we can become a source of heat in the sense that we already have heat energy in us which is leading to thermal discomfort which is what causes the amount of discomfort when we're doing jogging or when we are in an agitated state of mind this method of of cooling naturally sees us as a source of our own cooling we can be masters of our own you know, small little destinies, at least with respect to cooling in this case. So this is what this point is trying to emphasize is that heat in our body is a consequence of metabolism and we can lose it through radiation, convection and conduction rather than becoming recipients of artificial cooling. In the first uh, slide where we looked at the X and Y axis of temperature and humidity, that is a relatively simplistic notion of thermal comfort. Uh, they are still part of the overall matrix of thermal comfort considerations. That's air temperature and relative humidity. Nonetheless, there are four other parameters which are quite accepted now as contributors to thermal comfort or discomfort. Uh, one of the new ones that, that was not uh, dealt with earlier is the idea of radiation, which means that even if the air temperature is not very comfortable, but if the radiant temperature of the wall is comfortable, which means it's a cool surface, this can promote the feeling of thermal comfort as well. In addition to that, just movement of air. So not the temperature of the air, but just even movement of slightly warm air on the human skin is a great enabler of thermal comfort. We will work uh, to learn more about these in the next few slides. The other two, which is clothing and metabolic rate, have conventionally been thought of as fixed elements. We can't, they are inviolable, which means we can't really, you know, manipulate this and try to tell people, hey, what if you change your clothing, uh, you know, system or, or the, the patterns that you, uh, you have culturally of, of wearing certain kinds of clothes. That's considered to be a no-go area. Similarly with the metabolic rate, um, it is... A very difficult conversation to have with people to tell them to not you know, do a lot of activity if they want to feel thermal, thermally comfortable. So these two are considered to be, uh, as we can see in the next slide, these are called environmental factors. This is something that we can actually manipulate and do crafty, clever design around to make people feel thermally comfortable. These are called, is called personal, yes, these, these can be controlled through design and these are called personal factors. Though uh, one can uh, legitimately question whether this is inviolable, now there are programs uh, that are running across uh, India and in some other countries where people are challenging these conventional notions of wearing excessive amount of clothing in at least in closed spaces and then using air conditioning to battle the thermal discomfort that we have first created for ourselves. Uh, so it's not as inviolable as it has been. Till now. These are values for different kinds of metabolic uh, activities and the amount of heat that they generate, which just indicates that depending on what kind of space you're designing, for example, if you're designing a gymnasium, the thermal comfort requirements will be very different because of the metabolic activity being much higher than, say, a training center for an IT company where there isn't too much metabolic activity. There's a lot of uh, activity in the computers and those kinds of systems, but the human body is not generating too much heat. This is a table that provides you with the impact of clothing. Right? So these are the personal factors which we can't really do much about. So they've just been listed here. Uh, what is interesting to note here is there is a very broad or, or wide disparity between the insulation values of certain kinds of formal clothing. For example, let's look at coats over jackets and trousers. These have very high insulating values. Whereas if you use, for example, cotton shirts, short sleeve shirts, 
uh, light blouse shirts with long sleeves for example it's a, got a much lower value in terms of insulation than coats over jackets etc let's move on yes so now moving to the four factors that we can do something about the first one we will deal with is radiation to understand this one must understand this concept of what's called mean radiant temperature just intuitively dissecting this word mean means average radiant means the experience of the radiation coming from the walls and temperature means the temperature at which the radiation is coming again from first principles one can imagine lower mean radiant temperatures will lead to more thermal comfort yes how does one go about calculating this this mysterious value of mean radiant temperature we'll get to in a bit right but these two points just essentially emphasize that even if we don't have very low air temperature by lowering the mean radiant temperature we can accept high air temperatures around us thereby reducing the air conditioning load and achieving thermal comfort right this idea of mean radiant temperature is the central organizing principle for and designing principle for radiant cooling systems which will be addressed subsequently All right so let's understand how median mean radiant temperature is actually calculated in this example there is a person sitting in front of a fireplace and this is the central source of radiation uh, this is a cold place so there is no they've shown skis uh, skiers and and uh, no foliage on the trees here which indicates that there's no sunlight coming in here of course that's why they have the fireplace on this person's experience of radiation or mean radiant temperature is greatly governed by the angle of the the flame which means that if it's a large flame radiating outwards using uh, or through a broad angle that would lead to a much higher mean radiant temperature than the same temperature flame but which is smaller and exposes the occupant to a lesser angle right we'll explore this idea mathematically in the next slide right this is the mathematical relationship between the various elements in a room and the mean radiant temperature very simply put mean radiant temperature is the weighted average temperature that is experienced by a certain occupant in a room weighted by the angle that the occupant makes with the walls around them and the emissivity of each of the walls so before we get to the equation for instance in the center of the room i would be equally exposed or my viewing angle for each of the walls would be equal which means each of these angles would be 90 degrees right however if i was in one corner of the room here for instance my viewing angle would be much higher for this wall and for this wall because i'm here on this side it would be this wall and this wall so on and so forth so once the angles have been worked out one uses those angles multiplies it by the temperature for each of these walls and further multiplies it by the emissivity of the wall as one can imagine if you have two walls of the same temperature but one has higher emissivity that influences the mean radiant temperature more than the one with low emissivity so let's use that idea of mean radiant temperature and use it to calculate what is called the operative temperature this essentially builds the the story of using radiation versus convection or other processes which are the norm in air conditioning systems essentially what this mathematical relationship is indicating is that the human occupants of spaces sense what is called as the operative temperature and neither just the air temperature and neither just the mean radiant temperature by this uh, we mean that you can have a relatively high air temperature and at the same time you can have a relatively low mean radiant temperature and the average of the two is what is felt by the occupant right uh, this is what the temperature in the space feels like which can be used very very advantageously in the design of air conditioning systems 
which have radiation as uh, doing part of the load. For example, I can have an experience of 28 degrees by keeping the air temperature at 30, for example, right? which means I can set the AC at 30 degrees centigrade and at the same time I can have the, the walls at 26 degrees and my body will feel an average of the two. Right? So this has energy conservation benefits. The position of the person in the space or the persons in the space is very important to determine what the mean radiant temperature is because the viewing angles change. This also alludes to the idea that when you have radiation cooling in the walls versus the ceiling or the floor, there is a very broad disparity in the amount of radiant cooling that is experienced by different people because the people along the peripheries of the wall will feel a very very acute or uh, sharp angle with the walls and that will enhance their mean radiant temperature sensation whereas people in the center will have relatively smaller angles with the walls and that will inhibit their feeling of of radiant cooling this therefore alludes to the idea that it is more beneficial to have ceiling or floor cooling so that everybody has a relatively equitable sensation of mean radiant temperature. As mentioned earlier, there has been a questioning and critical thinking in the world of cooling in the last few years where the conventional oceans have been challenged and they have uh, encountered a lot of resistance from more progressive thinkers about thermal comfort. What that has done is the conventional standard, the traditional standard, which is called the ASHRAE standard 55, which only looked at the physiological factors, all those factors that we looked at, plus the personal factors, six of them, have now been reformulated and have become just a part of all the considerations that need to be thought of or need to be accounted for when designing a thoughtfully cooled building. This standard is called the ASHRAE Adaptive Standard, which makes it even more subjective than the previous definition. What this includes, which the earlier standards never included, is the idea that human beings have an autonomous adaptive capability, which means that in certain kinds of temperature conditions or weather conditions, they have more resilience to, uh, to be able to withstand higher temperatures and humidities, and at other times of the year, they have more resilience against cold conditions and drier uh, levels of humidity. So, this standard includes physiological factors which were earlier as well as part of it, behavioral factors, right, which means more to do with the, the state of mind as well as, sorry, habits. The third factor, which has not been part of the previous conceptions of thermal comfort standards, is the inclusion of psychological factors which allude to the idea that different states of mind have a very palpable and measurable influence on the thermal comfort experienced by occupants of a space. Here are some recent research studies which emphasize and validate this idea that the state of mind is a very important regulator of thermal comfort or uh, manipulator of thermal comfort. For example, breathing patterns change and that changes the stress levels, so on and so forth. In addition to direct influences on the state of mind such as breathing or other behavioral influences, two other factors that can directly influence the perception of thermal comfort by an occupant is the color of the space around them and the second is the noise level. As uh, this slide here indicates that recent research has shown that manipulating the cool or the, the temperature level of colors around a occupant can alter the perception of thermal comfort and they report different temperatures um, which they are sensing uh, irrespective of the, the air conditioning temperature or the air temperature. The same thing with noise, elevated noise levels can exacerbate the feelings of thermal discomfort and create a sense of being uh, in discomfort. Indicated in the earlier part of the presentation was this debate about the standard of 
thermal comfort which is defined by the ashray community uh, in the past in the earlier parts of the the decades uh, of the century and then the evolution of that standard to accept the adaptability the inherent adaptability that human beings have uh, these two standards are now considered to be equivalent in terms of their validity in terms of their applicability and we'll look a little bit at the details of each of these two thermal comfort standards which can be employed by building designers right uh, so there is a choice available to people and we will learn a little bit more about them in the next few slides so this is the old comfort model the ashray standard fit 55 comfort model and when we say model what we mean by that is a set of parameters that must be adhered to by the building designer with respect to the kind of conditions that prevail once the building is operating uh, operating so according to this model which is shown or depicted pictorially here on the x axis you have the operative temperature if we recollect operative temperature is the temperature that is sensed by the occupant which is a average of the air temperature and the radiant temperature of the surrounding here is the operative temperature and here is the dew point temperature on the uh, y axis or the humidity ratio which means the higher the humidity level the higher the dew point temperature what this chart here indicates is that even in the old model it was understood that in winter and in summer human beings have different tolerance levels or preference levels for temperature and humidity what this is indicating here is that in winter people can tolerate lower temperatures because they're just used to more cold and frigid conditions outside which means that say if it is 5 degrees centigrade outside in in the peak of winter say in january we do not need to provide very warm conditions inside the building say at 20 degrees the person can benefit and feel thermally comfortable by a slight increase in temperature say from 5 degrees to something like 15 to 18 degrees conversely in summer because the outside conditions are already very harsh and you know uh, quite uh, grueling the temperature levels are say at 40 degrees in some Indian cities in the in the middle of summer the occupant need not feel 18 degrees when they come into an enclosed space even a relatively elevated temperature of say 25 or 28 degrees would be sufficient so this chart here indicates the sliding comfort band for uh, even just looking at physiological factors for human beings all right so this is the visual representation of the comfort zone and what they're saying here like we indicated already earlier is that winter and summer differ very significantly in winter the uh, tolerance levels allow us to have lower temperatures available in, inside the building which means the heating can be uh, more thoughtfully done and can be appropriately sized in summer again we do not need to achieve very low temperatures we can live with temperatures of even 28 degrees as this chart here indicates right now there are also instances where all of these notions can still be considered very rigid for example there could be periods where the temperature outside is so high say if it's 45 degrees that even something beyond this relatively rigid box might be considered to be comfortable by people so uh, this chart also does not indicate the time of the day when certain conditions would be more comfortable for example in the middle of summer say for example you have a hot and dry region even though in the peak period the temperatures are 40 degrees in the night time the temperature might drop to down to 20 degrees so what this uh, this critique here is indicating is that this chart just tells you summer and winter it is not fluid enough or it's not inclusive enough to give you a sense of what are the conditions irrespective of seasons when these comfort models can be challenged and can be uh, perhaps thought through so what they're saying uh, or the critique uh, the nucleus of the critique was that do we need to stick to these tight temperature conditions throughout the year or can we vary the thermal comfort conditions depending on the outside temperature and humidity so as you can imagine those boxes have now been stretched out 
through a lot of negotiation, through a lot of uh, debate and provision of scientific proof, etc. And the adaptive comfort standard is looks more like this. By, by this, what we mean is that if you look at the monthly outdoor air temperature, which is on the x-axis here, and look at the indoor operative temperature, what this chart is indicating here is that as the outdoor temperature increases, we can tolerate higher and higher temperatures. So it's a, it's a contiguous sliding scale of comfort rather than just two boxes which are differentiated by summer and winter. Right? As it is, most you know, Indian cities, for example, don't have classically defined summers and winters. There are climates where, um, or, or regions where you have a composite climate and they don't fall into the narrowly defined boxes of these four seasons that are seen in the global north, for example. So this is an equation which just indicates that the operative comfort temperature is directly proportional to the outside temperature. Right? The building designers can choose to adhere to this model rather than that old notion and this has direct energy efficiency benefits which we will address in a short period of time. Right. Um, so what it's, this one is indicating is that as you get warmer, I can accept higher indoor temperatures, right? So this looks like an ascending line. All right. This notion of adaptive comfort started with, again, with the ASHRAE community sort of letting go a little bit of their turf and accepting scientific uh, truth and wisdom uh, into their models. Indian researchers in the earlier parts of this, of this century realized that the Indian conditions or the Indian climatic conditions and the Indian physiological conditions are sufficiently different that we perhaps need to evolve our own adaptive comfort standard and that led to work which eventually distilled itself into what's called the Indian model of adaptive comfort. This is uh, some of the key highlights of the, the precursor studies that were used in the development of the standard. What they found to you know, their great surprise was that in India, occupants in air-conditioned air -conditioned buildings have a much broader tolerance range than conventionally uh, was, was thought. Which means that earlier people had thought that 18 degrees is like this, this holy grail, this uh, you know, written in stone sort of fact which we all have to meet in our buildings and they realize that Indians actually prefer a absolutely higher range even. So it's not even spanning 18 degrees. This is on the right side of 18 degrees in terms of uh, preference for warmer conditions. And what they also found very surprisingly was that if the building is naturally ventilated, which means it's not a glass box and you can use the other parts of thermal comfort as, as you perhaps remember, Thermal comfort is defined by not just temperature and humidity, there are a total of six factors that, are, that could be used and could be modified to achieve thermal comfort. What they found was that air movement can really aid thermal comfort and even if the temperature is border at 31 degrees, providing adequate air movement leads to a situation where people report adequate thermal comfort. Right? All right. So, what are the implications of this more liberal view of thermal comfort compared to the more conservative and rigid view of thermal comfort. What that does is, it directly reduces the importance of artificial air conditioning. Let me explain this a little bit more elaborately. Here are charts which indicate the weather conditions prevalent in four Indian cities. Here you have hot and dry, one climatic zone. Warm and humid, moderate, composite. Except for the cold climate condition, all the four major conditions are indicated on this chart here. Each of these dots represents one hour worth of data. So this is the average, so one single dot here represents the average temperature and the average humidity, which is on the y-axis, for that one hour. The, the clustering here, you know, uh, goes along with the intuitive um, clustering that you would, you would perhaps imagine for something like say a Mumbai, where the temperatures are moderate, but the humidity is, is high. A Delhi, all these dots are spread about. Okay, so what has the adaptive comfort model done 
which has aided the 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 mission to become more energy efficient as a civilization uh, through our buildings what this box here indicates is the acceptable thermal comfort level in the adaptive mode compared to the earlier rigid box of thermal comfort which was a narrowly defined box that sat somewhere arbitrarily in the center here of these charts what that meant was if you had a box that was here irrespective of where what the outside weather conditions were right so imagine the box always in the same place over here you would see that in places like for example a delhi or a mumbai the number of hours where the outside conditions are already comfortable would be reduced which means that the air conditioning design sort of philosophy would compel the the building designer to use air condition air conditioning for all those dots where the comfort levels are outside this narrowly defined box but the expansion of this box would actually immediately bring in a lot of hours which were uh, earlier thought as being uncomfortable thermally co uncomfortable hours now into a acceptable level of thermal comfort therefore the size of this box is directly proportional to the amount of importance that air conditioning has the smaller the box the more important or the more air conditioning use you are sort of being encouraged to use or being compelled to use almost the broader the box the lesser the importance of air conditioning right so we immediately changed our view of the centrality of air conditioning by changing the standard itself another nuance of this uh, chart here is that whenever you have conditions where you feel uh, a human being is likely to feel cold hot humid dry those people have more adaptability so for example people living in delhi which would have a wide range of adaptability because their bodies have gone through many many cycles of this rigorous you know temperature change and humidity change throughout the year so they have a broader thermal comfort zone it's broad whereas in a mumbai and in a bangalore for example people have relatively less adaptability because they just have an experience these varying conditions over time right so this is also another nuance which is indicated here more clustering of the data the shorter or the more uh, the narrow or the thermal comfort band the advent of more choice in the thermal comfort uh, view of the world has led to more availability of options for building designers you know just like they say with great power comes great responsibility this here indicates that now that we have a range of thermal comfort models we now have the responsibility to apply them wisely for different kinds of situations right so so the the uh, the responsibility levels on building designers on thermal comfort designers for example has increased uh, given the fact that now we have multiple choices so it is possible to look at which thermal comfort model is applicable not just for a building but within a building which region requires what kind of thermal comfort model depending on the expectations and the possible experiential conditions that will prevail when the building is in in occupation say for example a building has different kinds of use uh, use areas there is a lobby say for example we are talking at a uh, talking about a hotel there is a hotel lobby which is the place where people from outside very harsh weather conditions come in into the building for the first time this is their first experience of thermal comfort there we can be a little more liberal with the kind of temperature ranges we provide people will have already experienced harsh conditions so they don't need very very cold conditions for example when they come in you know in the summer summer months so that area can use the adaptive comfort model whereas for example you have a a spa or you have a certain room where people are expect very very uh, intricately controlled temperature and humidity conditions there they would want for example in in the rooms even perhaps 20 degrees some some of the guests especially if they are guests who live from who've come from other parts of the world 
those regions of the building can use perhaps the old ASHRAE standard 55 model. So what this is indicating is that we can choose to decouple and deconstruct a building uh, which has been constructed in terms of thermal comfort and apply different standards which, which means that you can use different kinds of cooling strategies to achieve different thermal comfort levels. So say for example in the lobby of the building you can just use natural ventilation perhaps and that might provide adequate ventilation whereas in the rooms maybe just adequate ventilation will not be sufficient right. So this is what we're trying to indicate here that you can program different zones differently in terms of thermal comfort. All right. Yes, this just goes uh, to reiterate the point that we just made. Right. So looking at the, uh, the visual representation of the thermal comfort model and how just the rethinking of it and the reimagining of the shape has immediately allowed for greater energy efficiency in the world. Right. Uh, let's explore this idea a little bit further. Here on the x-axis, you have the dry bulb temperature, which is nothing but just the ordinary air temperature as we measure it. On this y-axis is humidity. The earlier rigid notion led to a box of this size. Right? This is what everybody thought across the world, irrespective of whether you're from Copenhagen or you're from Kolkata, you would want to be experiencing these thermal comfort conditions. As you can see, for a city like Chennai, the number of naturally comfortable hours, which are these black dots which are within this box, is very, very low. Of course, expanding this to a more rectangular sort of shape immediately would say I would need air conditioning for fewer hours than I had earlier imagined, right? So let's explore this idea. What this chart also, by the way, indicates is the amount of effort the building designer has to do to essentially take one of these dots and put them into the box here. So we can almost think of this as like one of those tele games where it's a race against time to try and get each dot into the box, right? So literally an air conditioning engineer or a thermal comfort designer needs to think of ways to bring this in, bring this in so that the occupants are comfortable for as many hours as possible through the year, right? So that's what we all are trying to do. That's what all our buildings should be trying to do. Further away, these are, for example, places like Chennai, Mumbai, all their weather data points will be clustering around here, which means air conditioners or other kinds of devices that are used by buildings will require a lot of effort to bring it in here. Whereas if you, when we see this later, we will see that certain cities, for example, Bangalore and even Pune will have more clustering around the central parts. And irrespective of whether you use the adaptive model or the ASHRAE model, if we can just promote the permeation of the outside conditions into the building, right, which is what's known as a mixed mode building, then we can automatically just shut the air conditioning systems off for those hours because the outside air is good enough. It just needs a little bit of filtration and it can satisfy the thermal comfort needs of the occupants. Right. So here is a quick snapshot of some well-known Indian cities and the number of what's called free cooling hours or naturally comfortable hours that are already prevalent in these cities. And as we can see, in places which are not extreme, extremely humid places, for example, Chennai, all these other ones here are within a sort of moderate climate uh, region, which means they have a wide range of, of climatic conditions. Uh, you can see that 15% of hours out of the whole year are already comfortable. And especially if you look at daytime hours, a lot of the percentage actually goes up because say if air conditioning is right now being used 24 hours, we can at least stop air conditioning at certain times of the day, even if we want to keep them on in the daytime, right? Say in the daytime, the air temperature is quite high which means that even if you bring in air, it's warm air and that might not lead to adequate comfort. But the percentage of nighttime hours that are comfortable could be almost double of these, right? So what uh, we could do in these kinds of buildings is first of all, you know, deviate from the sin of building ice boxes, which do not allow for this outside weather, um, sorry, glass boxes, which do not allow this weather to come in and affect the the thermal comfort of the building. Uh, 
and for the remaining hours we can have an air conditioning system but this immediately allows for at least 15 percent energy efficiency in these in these cities by just having the ability to bring in the outside conditions into the building right. it is of course easy to measure thermal comfort once the building has been constructed it can be done through interviews it can be done through um, surveys it can be done through also some simulation right um, of the occupants right now however how does a building designer preempt the thermal comfort conditions and then use that knowledge to alter the design adequately to achieve thermal comfort with the least amount of energy possible so there are a couple of mathematical relationships that would be very useful for air conditioning engineers or engineering students for example to be able to do this kind of of um, modeling of thermal comfort right so this is how th this entire uh, set of the training now is just going to focus on how do you do post occupancy prediction of thermal comfort there are two concepts that are involved in here the first one is called the pmv or the predicted mean vote index and that is used to then eventually calculate a term called percentage of people dissatisfied right and we look at the mathematical relationships that are, are uh, implied in these two terms here right okay so don't get freaked out by this it is a very elaborate mathematical model which of course cannot be um, you know utilized through you know hand calculations eventually you would have computer programs doing this but essentially what we're trying to indicate here is that the predicted mean vote which is what will people report as their thermal comfort uh, sensation will it be a positive will it be a negative one etc is influenced by a similar set of parameters as we had indicated in the earlier part of the training where there were six thermal comfort parameters here they are slightly higher the number of uh, uh, parameters in this equation but all the ones that were part of the six thermal comfort parameters are here in addition to that there's a couple of other things for example external work which is the external load that's coming into the building uh, a couple of other constants etc right so what this does is it allows a designer to play around with various kinds of building design parameters for example something like this the mean radiant temperature I can keep everything else constant and just play around with mean radiant temperature and altering that will change my predicted mean vote value right and if this predicted mean vote is not adequate we look at the acceptable ranges of this if that is not adequate we can continue manipulating each of these parameters to be able to get adequate thermal comfort that's the the underlying logic of this whole assessment okay so let's see what pm predicted mean vote is all about now predicted mean vote leads to values that are in this range which means that if your calculation leads to a value of say plus three people in general will report very very hot conditions if they report or the calculation leads to a value of negative three people will report very uncomfortable conditions this is another method of calculating predicted mean vote it is a slightly simplified method which requires only metabolic laid, uh, rate and the thermal load but the this L itself is the is is the the, um, the difficult part to assess here. So, if people want to get to uh, the the more granular and more uh, rudimentary uh, method of assessment, you would use the the previous one, right? Which has a lot of variables. This is a more macro assessment, but both should lead to similar sort of values. Now, what do you do with this PMV value once it's calculated, right? How do you predict? How many people will be dissatisfied, percentage of people dissatisfied with this thermal comfort? Here is the equation that builds on this whole thermal comfort story. Once you have a predicted mean vote value, you would embed it in this curve, right? And we saw those values of plus three to negative three. What this chart here tells you, statistically speaking, if you end up with a predicted mean vote of say, for example, 0.5 on the warmer side, you will have 10% of the people dissatisfied. Here is a percentage of people dissatisfied against a predicted mean vote, right? Of course, if you are right in the center, the percentage of people dissatisfied, right, would be the lowest, 
But what this indicates is that no matter what you do, there is going to be some people who are dissatisfied. So the goal is not to achieve 0% discomfort, just an acceptable level of, of discomfort, right? Uh, the standard, the ASHRAE standard for percentage of people dissatisfied for the building to be considered a thermally comfortable building is 5%, which means no more than 5% of people should be dissatisfied, which means their predicted mean vote should be either say approximately point, negative 0.2 or plus 0.2, right? Uh, that's the, the range you need to be in so that you achieve about 5% of people dissatisfied. That's the ASHRAE standard. All this logic, this mathematical relationships can be very cumbersome and very repetitive and quite mind-numbing at, at a certain point. So what has happened is that they have embedded all this into a tool which we will look at a little bit later, which is available as a free resource online. If you have further questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us uh, on our email addresses or through our portal fairconditioning.org. Thank you.